Hello, this podcast is entitled Introduction to Computational Biology, and it's being presented to the NCSSM online program, Introduction to Computational Science. So we'll talk a little bit in this section about what computational biology is, and there are a number of different definitions and terminologies used for this field. But uh, fundamentally, computational biology involves the development and application of uh, analytical and theoretical methods, basically math modeling and computational simulation applied to biological, behavioral, and social systems. And it's like everything else in computational science, a very uh, uh, interdisciplinary field. We're using uh, computational science, we're using mathematics, particularly statistics, we're using biology, and mostly what we're looking at here is genetics. If you ask most people what computational biology is, they're going to say the use of computing and mathematics, particularly statistics again, to the uh, field of genetics. And that's the way that I think about uh, the term. And we have a course entitled uh, Introduction to Computational Biology. And the, the focus of that course is completely on how we use computing to study genetics. So over in the graphic over there, you see a variety of of, of images, and some of these may or may not be familiar to you. You see a at the top that thing with a black square and the white circle. That's a pedigree map, so that's showing how uh, genetic traits are inherited by uh, generations. So there's two parents at the top, and then the children underneath there, and their children underneath there. Uh, you see a cartoon picture of the DNA double helix. Uh, over in the bottom left corner, you see TACG. Those are called uh, base pairs or nucleotides. Those are the genetic letters that make up uh, what's known as the genome, which is the set of instructions uh, that decide all of your genetic characteristics. Um, and the little uh, sort of colored Christmas tree looking thing over in the bottom right hand corner is a, um, a microarray experiment and we do we look at those those data sets in the computational biology course um, the the computational biology is also known as bioinformatics so the two terms are used reasonably interchangeably there'll be some people who will differentiate computational biology from bioinformatics but most people probably use those two terms interchangeably and there's all kinds of uh, things that we're studying in computational biology or bioinformatics. If you look in the middle of the graphic there, again, you're looking at uh, the, the, the main idea is that there's a lot of data out there uh, about biology, again, particularly genetics data, data about DNA, and we use a variety of mathematical methods or algorithms. Um, we use statistics, and we use a lot of visualization, data visualization, to try to understand what's happening in a biological system. So there's all kinds of things that we can do with bioinformatics. Uh, we can, starting at the top right-hand corner, we can search for new drugs. Uh, we can look for genetic variations that might cause a disease. Uh, we try to optimize uh, therapies for people to, to get well. Um, we can try to sequence the DNA. So again, you're seeing A, C's, T's, and G's. In the bottom right-hand corner, we can sequence the amino acid structure of a protein. Uh, over on the bottom uh, left, we can study molecular interactions. And we do this, by the way, uh, heavily in the uh, medicinal chemistry course that's offered through the online program. Uh, we can look at biochemical pathways, so be able to figure out um, how uh, different things work in, in an organism. And we can do things like make DNA chips so we can compare uh, different conditions that a cell might have. So it's a pretty broad field, lots of things that you can do if you are a computational biologist or a bioinformatics specialist. But the central idea here is you are handling data, uh, you're using mathematics, again, primarily statistics, and you're trying to visualize the results of all of that mathematical statistical work to try to get a sense of what's happening in a biological system. Um, the, the primary focus area for computational biology and bioinformatics is genomics, 
And that's, a, as it says here, this Wikipedia quote says, um, is a discipline in genetics concerned with the study of the genomes of organisms. And again, the genome is the entire set of instructions in an organism that decide uh, what its characteristics are going to be. So you have what's known as the genotype. The genotype is that list of instructions, the A's, C's, T's, and G's, uh, that make up your DNA. And those, uh, that genotype will decide your phenotype. And a phenotype is the actual characteristic that an organism has. For example, a phenotype might be they have uh, gray hair, they have baldness, they have high blood pressure, they have low blood pressure. Um, lots of these kinds, these are all phenotypes, things that you can see, things that you can measure. Um, and so we're, we're interested in studying what's the relationship between the organism's genotype, those, what's in their DNA, and what physical characteristics uh, they may display. Um, so you see over on the right hand side, uh, you see the DNA double helix with the A's, C's, T's, and G's, and the double helix, the, the DNA, is all wrapped up and encoded in something called a chromosome, and every chromosome in your body, uh, excuse me, every cell in your body contains the entire set of chromosomes uh, that are found for your particular, for any particular organism. Um, some of the practical considerations in terms of studying um, how, do we, how do we study genes and how do we study the, gen the genome of an organism, um, we can't do studies obviously on humans. There are practical and ethical considerations that preclude us from being able to study uh, the genetics of humans. Although we do a lot of human genetic studies, um, it's pretty hard to uh, do experiments on humans, again, because of the logistical, practical, ethical issues. So fundamentally what we do in, um, in computational biology is we use model animals to study genetic conditions. We can, we can breed animals and they, uh, because they, they'll, they'll breed more quickly than humans, uh, we don't have to wait nine months for a, you know, a baby to be born, uh, we can uh, study lots of animals and get a good statistical analysis of the genetics of a particular animal. Three that we use in particular are the worm, the zebrafish, and the mouse. And Currently, this, this podcast is actually being uh, filmed at the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine. Um, and this is, the Jackson Lab is one of the preeminent uh, mouse genetics labs uh, in the world. So you see a picture at the bottom left there of uh, mice that are, being, that are in their cages in the mouse room. Uh, the Jackson Lab happens to be located on, in the middle of Acadia National Park. So you see on the bottom right there, you see the picture of the lab at the, at the bottom of that picture. And then you see the mountains of Acadia National Park uh, just to the, to the south of it. Um, and again, the Jackson Lab or the Jax Lab primarily is a mouse lab. And so they, they will breed mice to try to, to determine, make some decisions about the genetics of the mice. And the reason they do that is because mice are just like humans. So over on the left-hand side of the uh, graphic here, you see the genome of a human. And you probably know that there are um, 23 chromosomes or, uh, um, you know, 23 pairs of chromosomes. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 through 22. And then we have the X and the Y chromosomes. Females uh, have, uh, remember, we have pairs of chromosomes. Uh, so you'll have, females will have two X chromosomes, and that makes them a female. A male will have an X chromosome from the mother and a Y chromosome from the father, and that's what makes them male. And we've color-coded the chromosomes over here, because if you look over on the right-hand side, you'll notice that there, uh, we're showing you here the mouse chromosomes. And the mice only have 20 chromosomes, 1 through 19, and then the X and the Y. And everywhere where you see, so for example, if you, if you look at human chromosome number one, you see that that is entirely shaded in green. That doesn't mean the chromosome is green. We've just color-coded it to, to uh, help see the image here. And what that means is all of the genes that are on chromosome one 
can be found somewhere in the mouth. So for example, on chromosome one, you see a big chunk of green at the bottom of that chromosome. Those are, so there are genes in there that are the same as are found in chromosome number one of the human. If you look over on chromosome number four, uh, you see another big chunk of green and uh, those chromosomes that are in chrom mouse chromosome number four are also found in uh, the human on chromosome number one. So there's not a direct matching of chromosome one in the human to chromosome one in the mouse, but we can find the same genes in the mouse that we find in the human. And we take advantage of that fact to uh, be able to study mice and then be able to say something intelligent about what might happen in a human. Uh, here's a cool picture of how we test mice on the left hand side there. Uh, the contraption, you see the white mouse there being put in, inside a little black cage uh, with a little hole there that they can poke their nose out. But uh, what we're doing there is taking the blood pressure of the mouse. So this is a blood pressure testing device. Uh, this device actually was uh, invented uh, in, uh, in North Carolina. The company that makes them is in North Carolina. And this uh, contraption was designed primarily uh, at the request of Oliver Smithies, who's at the UN, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, and he won the Nobel Prize recently for his work in the genetic study of, of, of organisms, and mice were one of them. So what we're doing there is we're putting the mouse's tail through a little blood pressure cuff, and we're taping it down so the mouse doesn't wiggle too much, and then we're being able to test the blood pressure of, of the mouse. And this machine can test uh, six mice at the same time. Over on the right-hand side there, you see basically an, an X-ray structure. And what we're studying here is obesity in the mice. So the top picture, um, the mouse weighs 22 grams and has about 31% body fat. The mouse at the very bottom there, this mouse has been bred specifically to study obesity. So the, the, the mouse has genetically been... Uh, uh, developed so we can study obesity in mice and then be hopefully be able to say something about humans. And this, my, this mouse weighs 50 grams and has 50% body, body, uh, um, body mass index of, of 50, which is very, very high. All right, so a little bit of the genetics of this. I don't want to get too much into this because you may not have this background. Um, but what we're doing, again, is we're breeding organisms, and that's why we use worms and zebrafish and mice, because they breed very quickly, they breed very uh, cheaply, uh, they're easy to raise, uh, relatively easy to raise, and we can study them uh, without any ethical problems. So what we have here uh, is what's called a back cross. So at the top of the picture, you, we have a, a mother, a mom mouse, and on the then we have a uh, a dad mouse, and the so we're going to call mom A and uh, uh, dad B, and these are two different strains of mice, meaning these are two mice with completely different genetic um, makeup. So uh, we're using blue and red here to indicate a genetic makeup. So we say the A mouse is homozygous blue. That means homozygous means all the same. So all of the uh, the genetics there are, we're going to call them blue genetics. The dad is homozygous red. And what we're going to do is we're going to breed these mice and we're going to produce a, uh, an offspring and we're going to call that offspring F1. And that stands for filial first generation. So that's a first generation offspring. And notice that the mouse got one blue chromosome uh, from the mom and one red chromosome from, from the dad or one set of I should say one set of blue um, genetics from the mom and one set of red genetics from the, from the dad. What we're going to do now um, is we're going to crossbreed that F1 mouse back with the mom. And that's called a back cross. And then what we're going to get is a, a whole series of um, a next generation of mice, and we're going to call these back cross mice. And you see now they're all combinations of blues and reds. So starting on the far left-hand side, you see that mouse has uh, everything from the mom and then a mixture of mom and dad uh, for one uh, set of chromosomes. Uh, and it goes across and there's all kinds of... So what we've done here is we've developed some 
uh, genetic diversity or genetic variety in, in the mice that we're able to study. So now we can start looking at uh, some of the genetics of these back cross mice and hopefully be able to find some interesting characteristics that have some impact on how we understand human disease or human metabolism. Uh, there's also what's called an intercross. Again, we start with the same type of parents, uh, A's and B's, homozygous for blue, homozygous red. Uh, we breed them, we get uh, a first generation or a filial generation, and then we, we breed the siblings. So we breed a brother with a sister and get what's called an F2 generation. And you see we get a very different uh, looking mix there in terms of what the, that generation looks like as compared with what the back cross mice look like. So there are reasons why sometimes they'll use a back cross and sometimes they'll use an intercross, um, but there are different ways of crossing or breeding these mice to be able to get the genetic characteristics that we're interested in studying. Um, so again, this is all mouse breeding, and so here's a, some sample data that you're going to be working with uh, in the labs this week. Uh, we're going to cross an, an AJ mouse, the J by the way stands for Jackson Lab. We're going to cross a, a mouse that's been, uh, that's called the AJ strain, and we're going to uh, breed that mouse with a C57 black 6 mouse. Uh, we just call that black 6 for short. And these are two different mouse strains that have been raised and are uh, sold to labs by the Jackson Lab. And the data there is down the bottom. So what you have there is each row is a mouse. Uh, so starting at row number four, five, six, all the way down through, through 12, there's 250 mice. I'm not showing you all the data. Uh, so each row is a mouse. And the data we have, the phenotype data, uh, the physical characteristics, we're studying blood pressure here, represented by BP. Um, I think these are all male mice, so under sex it says male. Uh, there's PGM, which stands for parental grandmother, and it's important to know sometimes where these mice come from. So knowing the, the, the grandmother or the father mouse is sometimes important. And then what you see across starting in column D, uh, where the first one being D1MIT296, uh, that's a genetic marker. So what the folks have done is they've inserted genetic markers uh, at various places in the chromosomes. So here you see D1MIT296. Right underneath there, there's the number one. So that's been inserted in chromosome number one. And we've inserted it at a specific location in the chromosome. And we measure these locations in terms of units of centimorgans or CM. So D1MIT296 has been inserted in at uh, 3.3 centimorgans uh, on the chromosome. Um, under each marker and for each mouse, you'll see the genotype. So if you look at the very first mouse that has an AB genotype, that means uh, it got uh, some, uh, some of its chromosomes from the AJ mouse and some of the chromosomes from the black 6 mouse. So that means we got, uh, there's some parts from A and there's some parts from B. Okay. If you look down a little further, it looks like over on the, uh, the right a little bit, you see some AA mice. Uh, that means they, all of the genes for that particular mouse at that particular marker came from, from the AJ mouse. Um, I don't see any BBs here. But there may be some down later in the data set. Okay, so what happens? Why did we breed those mice? Okay, again, in this particular case, we're interested in blood pressure. And if you look at this histogram, so what we're showing here is the, the blood pressure of mice going from 80 millimeters of mercury to about 130 millimeters of mercury. So if a mouse has a blood pressure of 80 millimeters of mercury, they have low blood pressure or they're hypertensive. If they have 130 millimeters of mercury, they have high blood pressure or they're hyper, hypertensive. And what you notice over there is the AJ mice, and that's represented in blue, uh, tend to have really low blood pressure. So if we only study the blood pressure of AJ mice, that particular mouse strain, they're all going to have low blood pressure. Whereas the black 6 mice, C57 black 6J, those mice tend to have a higher blood pressure. So that's why these are good breeding pairs, because we're breeding a low blood pressure mouse with a high blood pressure mouse. 
And what we're hoping to see is to, to generate some genetic diversity. So the green line there, you see where we've crossed a B6 mouse with an A mouse. And in the filial generation one, uh, the blood pressures are more uh, in the center of the, of the data set. So the, the uh, offspring are, have uh, average blood pressure as compared to the mom and the dad. Likewise, there's a couple different ways of crossing them. We can cross B6 by A or A by B6. It makes a difference. And notice that the A by B6 mice also have more average blood pressures um, and more central to in the center of the, the data set. Notice, by the way, that the blood pressure histogram here uh, is what's called a normal distribution. That means it's, it has some low ones on the left, it has some low ones on the right, but it has sort of a, a nice curve. If you draw a line over the tops of those boxes, you'd see a nice what's called a bell-shaped curve, and that's called a normal distribution. Okay, so one of the things we want to be able to take a look at is what's called a genetic map. So what you're seeing here is at the bottom on the x-axis we have the chromosome number. On the y-axis we have uh, the location of things in centimorgans. Um, so I'll take a look at the X chromosome. Let's go over on the right-hand side of the genetic map there. And what you see there are four lines on the, the genetic uh, map there. What that means is we've inserted four markers, four genetic markers on the X chromosome. And we'll, we'll show you why we do this here in a minute. If we look over, say, at chromosome number four, uh, we've inserted a whole bunch of markers, and we tend to, they, they tend to be aggregated. Know how close, notice how, how many of them there are and how close they, they are together. And they're, they're done that way uh, for a reason to be able to try to find, to locate, places on these chromosomes that might be responsible for some genetic condition. So um, we want to create genetic maps so we have an idea of where the markers are, um, both in terms of what chromosome there are and where they're located in terms of centimorgans. The, one of the biggest things we want to do in computational biology, certainly in mouse studies, is find what's called a quantitative trait loci, loci, uh, loci or QTL. And a QTL is a location, that, that's what loci means, is a location on a chromosome that might have some statistical correlation or some statistical relevance to some phenotype. In this case, we're looking for blood pressure. So we're trying to find where on a chromosome, and certainly the first thing we need to know is what chromosome, we're trying to find where on a chromosome we might be able to find a gene or multiple genes that have something to do with blood pressure. So what you're seeing in this graphic here, all the M's represent a marker. Uh, so I have marker 1, marker 2, marker 3, marker 4, marker 5, marker 6. And at each marker, uh, for each mouse, so I have three mice here. Uh, at marker 1, I have an AA genotype, AA genotype at marker 2. AB genotype at marker 5 and AB genotype at marker 6 for that first mouse. And you can see uh, the other two mice. And again, we would do hundreds of mice, not mice, not three. So we think somewhere between marker 3 and marker 4, there's a QTL. There's a, a, a location there where that we think has something to do with blood pressure. And what we are trying to do in computational biology is to find that QTL. And then once we find that QTL, then to be able to study just that part of the chromosome and be able to hopefully find a gene or, or a couple genes that are directly uh, uh, related to uh, the characteristic of blood pressure. Okay, so we, we do that study, and I'll show you another graphic here in a minute, but what, we're, what I want to show you here is um, what we're trying again to do is find the, the, the relationship between the phenotype, in this case blood pressure, and the genotype. So you see on the graphic on the left-hand side there, we're looking at one of the markers. Um, this particular mouse has, um, uh, uh, or some of the mice, you see all these dots represent, each dot represents a mouse. So the mice that are BB homozygous uh, black 6 at this particular marker, 
have an average blood pressure of about, what is that, about 105 millimeters of mercury. And the mice that have a BA uh, genotype or something from the, the black six and something from the AJ mouse uh, tend to have an average or mean blood pressure a uh, little bit below 100 at that particular marker. At other markers, uh, they might not be the same. So for example, on uh, the marker D12, which is at chromosome 12, notice that BA, uh, BB genotypes don't make any difference. The average of the blood pressures tend to be about the same. Okay? So what we're thinking now is there may be something going on in chromosome 4 uh, that has something to do with blood pressure. So the way to do that is to see what's called a main scan plot. Um, I don't, I don't think this one is for blood pressure. I think this might be from another one. So what you see on the bottom axis there are all the chromosomes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, through 19, and then X. And then on the Y axis is what's called a LOD score, and this is a statistical calculation. And what we're looking for here, at, these should jump right out, of, right, at you, right out at you here, are some of these big peaks. And any chromosome that has a LOD score typically bigger than three, that means that chromosome might have a QTL, might have a chunk of DNA on that particular chromosome that has something to do with the phenotype that we're looking at. So if I scan across there, I immediately see that chromosome one is above three. So that's a uh, location. I'm going to start really focusing my attention on chromosome number one if I'm interested in studying whatever phenotype this main scan represents. Um, and then, of course, scanning right across your eyes should be drawn very quickly to chromosome number 10, which has a, a huge LOD score, uh, a little bit above four. So uh, chromosomes one and chromosomes 10 are, and this is not the blood pressure one, I don't think, chromosomes 1 and chromosomes 10 are uh, the two chromosomes that I want to really focus on um, to really get a sense of what's happening in terms of the, the genotypes or genetics of this organism for this particular phenotype. Notice we also have some suggestive uh, QTLs on chromosome 12. Uh, there's something interesting going on on chromosome 7. So it's rarely the case that a phenotype like blood pressure is only going to be found in one location on one chromosome. Usually there are genes across many, uh, there are genes across many chromosomes that are responsible for a phenotypic trait like blood pressure, and we have to study those. And uh, these, these QTL plots or main scan plots help us get started with that. Okay, if there's any questions, we'll talk about them in the video conference, and we'll see you online.